This is Psalm 102 in the Message, a podcast. I'm Jeff Ponder Twarty. Sometimes our spiritual journeys are marked early on by parents and our family who set a tone and we just fall into place. Sometimes it take us, takes us a while to fall into place and sometimes falling into place isn't so easy. But in the midst of all that, we find out that God is with us all along the way. Sometimes that, that's, that's the thing that makes it all worthwhile. I want to share a, my conversation with a friend of ours, Carol Gallette. She's a pastor with an artist's soul and a passionate seeker of God and a lover of family. Her story is worth hearing, so I'll talk to you afterwards on the other side. Carol Galletz, I am glad we're doing this. I don't know if you are, but I, I, I've been looking forward to us talking like this and uh, and with the intent of kind of like, I don't know, you sharing a little bit of your story because I think your story is, I, I'll say it, I think it's fascinating. And uh, um, I, 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 how, have you, let's just, let's just start here. My, well, you're a conversationalist, goodness gracious. You, you, are a, you are somebody that can talk and share uh, like blue blazes, uh, which is wonderful. It's part of your personality. How, how, how comfortable, how comfortable have you been or are you right now in, in kind of like sharing your story? My guess is you probably pretty are pretty much are. Is that right? I am getting more and more comfortable sharing it. And as God gives me the, the grace to, to share different parts of it and, uh, really to process what, what it is that he's done in my life over these last, uh, gosh, five decades. Actually, uh, Boy, you're old. Woo. Uh, I'm feeling it this week. This oh, is Lord. My, this is my birthday week, actually. That's right. That's right. Happy birthday. So, That's right. Yeah, so I had to renew my driver's license and um, <laughs> looking forward to celebrating with my family. But um, I've been pondering uh, the things we have talked about, about uh, different uh, significant life experiences. And as I have... Um, uh, let me just share a little bit about uh, my growing up. Years. Sure, yeah. Um, I was born as the last child in a family with four kids. Uh, I'm the only daughter. Uh, I have three big brothers. And my parents um, had actually bought the property right across the street from the church where I grew up. My parents in the 60s were part of a new church start, and it, it met in a high, in a elementary school in the neighborhood where they had a little white frame house as as a young married couple. Now this and was it, this was this was in Huntsville, right? This was in Huntsville, right? Yeah. Um, so they moved there as part of uh, what I call a rocket boom. I don't know if other people call it that, hmm. uh, but Dad worked in missile command and. So mom moved up there and joined him, and they uh, found uh, they were found by a pastor who was planning a church, and so they became part of a congregation there um, in the '60s that was given a piece of property um, in the area called the Highlands in Huntsville. Cool. And so when the church property was acquired, all the uh, the land in the neighborhood was available for purchase, and my parents bought the property right across the street from where their new church was being built. So it, to have the church across the streets is that thing. I mean, I grew up, um, I mean, the church, you step out and step out the doors of the house where I grew up, and you look to the left, and you'd look two blocks up the road, and there was the church where I grew up. Kiss United Methodist Church, and at night it's lit up, up the steeple. It is, you know, you could even say I don't want to say majestic. That's a little bit of a uh, over overstatement, but it's very, it's very pretty. And so, but at the same time, it's it's always there, you know. And it and it's it was always a reference point for us. Right. It was like um, like like we've term the lighthouse you know yeah the, the churches had such a predominant place in neighborhoods mm -hmm. at that time mm -hmm. um, yes which is something we've shifted from uh these days but that yeah. um 
having the church uh, right across the street from the house was was part of their um, you know an expression of their values. They love the church, and um, the day I was born, uh, Mama went to vote. It was a presidential election day, um, <laughs> and today is a presidential election yeah, day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that's significant for me. I'm celebrating all over the place. That's so, so uh, cool. While mom went to the hospital to vote, I mean, not to, to vote, yeah, to vote for me to be born. Mom went to vote and then went to the hospital for me to be born. But my dad was mm. at the church waiting on the delivery of the church furnishings, the pews and the pulpits. And oh, my goodness. All of those things. So. Uh, that's a funny story about my birth that my dad was waiting for a delivery at the church. That's funny. Uh, so I, I think that's that's kind of ironic because I have ended up uh, being so entangled with the life of the church all my life. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and then since the call uh, to ministry at an early age, and um, so that's led to to ultimately this this place where I am now sure. um, serving in full-time ministry. I'm getting captivated because, because the fact of the matter is, is that I do remember, I remember you have shared in the past about um, your, your desire and, and to, uh, and to be an artist. And that's, that's still a big part of, you could say, Oh, it's never far removed from your, let's say your Christian expression, or at least your, how you, how you see yourself as a Christian. Yeah, I would say so, that it's always been a part of my identity. Um, I think I identified as artist before I uh, came to realize I identified as Christian. Mm, um, yeah, I, yeah. I, I identified as creative um, and artistic, and mm -hmm. that, that really was part of my core identity. And when I did um, come into a, a deep relationship with Christ and, and with the infilling of the Holy Spirit, um, I had some tension in my life um, with uh, where was my loyalty, where was my devotion, um, was it toward uh, my creative nature, um, did I have to shut down my creative nature and yeah. everything become black and white and gray in order for me to um, honor God. It was. It was kind of a um, uh, a, t a season. My college experience was kind of a season of me um, struggling with uh, the question of if I could be expressive, creative, out of the box, different from other people, and still be a good Christian. Hmm. Hmm. Um, that's interesting. Um, so there was a, there was a conflict. It, it was an issue. It ended up being an issue of conflict, rather than something that would be a symbiotic kind of a relationship between uh, art and and uh, living at your faith. Is that fair? That is fair to say. I um, I guess I I, I kind of felt um, so much pride in my ability to create. Yeah. That when I became aware of of the presence of God in a new way, in a way w where I wanted to honor him and worship him um, and have have him be primary in my life. Um, I experienced some conviction, but also uh, an unhealthy kind of self-condemnation. Hmm. So hmm. that's that, interesting that, that that was a mixed bag for me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Your calling... And your sense of, of ministry, it's not it wasn't necessarily, or was it? Was it always in the sense of God is asking something of me um, in my life to do and to share in my giftedness and my abilities? Um, do, did you automatically think, uh, well, my only, my only outlet is... I guess is going to be in the pulpit, and you know, it, what was your orientation as far as um, your sense of calling and your living that out? Where did where did you where did you land first? As I think about my sense of calling and kind of the kind of the thread of how um, how throughout my life I felt called by God, um, the earliest thing I can put my finger on is 
as a six-year-old sitting in my preacher's <laughs> office, sitting at his desk. I don't know where he had moved to, but he let me have his desk because um, he was taking care of me after kindergarten, or maybe I got uh, he got called as my emergency number to come get me because I was sick or something. <laughs> but I was sitting behind the desk in the preacher's office, and he pulled out a beanbag frog and gave it to me. <laughs> I still have that frog to this day. How funny. And I remember sitting there, putting my hands on that desk, saying to myself, I can be the preacher. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, that's the terminology that I used as a, as a kindergartner yeah. about uh, what was possible for my life. And, you know, it, it never occurred to me that it would be a problem that I was a little girl. <laughs> right, right, right. Right. But I just had this sense of I can be the preacher. Excellent. Um, and uh, and I, I'm thankful for that memory because it, it really builds me up um, even in times when I struggle these days. Now, another significant moment in my calling thread was when missionaries that we sponsored came to our church. Um, they were... I think they were serving in Korea, and they they brought us things from Korea, and they told us about their mission there, and um, I just remember my heart racing hearing the stories of what God was doing in this other nation, yeah. and hearing stories about God doing <laughs> stuff now, like we read about in the Bible. <laughs> It sounds like I was such a holy young child. And the truth is, at the same time, I also really wanted to be a country singer. Um, I would sit out on the porch, and Mama had made this uh, this wooden box guitar, and I would, like, it had plastic strings, and it was horrible sounding. Um, but I would try to play music on it, and I would write really sad songs and just... Uh, I had this desire to be a country music singer, you know? Wow. Um, so there's a secret uh, that, that not many people know. But That's pretty but, cool. Yeah, so so it's not that I was like, oh, I was so sure of my calling as a young person, but things, um, I think I think the truth is about me that I, I have always been so sensitive uh, maybe an empath and um, music and story, uh, personal experiences that others share. Yeah. Uh, art. Yeah. Uh, puppies. All, all, all <laughs> this stuff touched my heart, and so my, the sensitivity of my heart is really where God has has been working and moving uh, in all these seasons. Yeah. Did you have, because uh, you uh, made reference to the fact of seeing yourself as a preacher, even though, and in, in what I heard, in what I heard, uh, even though being a girl, I could see myself as being a preacher. Um, who, who would, um, who would you point to now as being um, a model for you in that regard? Kind of like, in the sense of living out calling. Now, it might have been a missionary that you heard or you had follow-up contact with them afterwards or a pastor or whatever. Who who, who, uh, who were the models or what was one a particular model, perhaps, you would point to at this point? I think in, in, in childhood, um, one of the most significant um, experiences of of seeing somebody in action when, when I felt that I could identify um, with the pastor was at Camp Sumatanga when I was probably about 10 or 11 and Sandra Locke Godby was our chaplain for children's choral workshop which was we had had youth choir camp and then children's and youth choral workshop which all of that became music and arts week yeah which uh, has a big history at Camp Sumatanga mm -hmm. but the particular week that I um, just hang on to in my memory is the week that Sandra Locke Godby, who was one of the first women ordained in our conference, um, 
was our chaplain. And she uh, served as communion one night. And we were in uh, what's called Green Auditorium. It's the auditorium that's connected to the, um, the cafeteria. Mm-hmm. And the chairs were set up in the round. And the communion table was in the very center of the room. And I remember Sandra was wearing a white alb. Mm -hmm. And as she uh, talked through the communion liturgy uh, in a way that we children could could grasp and enter into it with her, um, she held up one hand um, with the sign language sign for I love you. Hmm. And she shared with us that as she was going to walk around the room and share this communion with us, um, that she would have her back toward us sometime, but she wanted us to see her hand and see this sign um, that showed um, that even if we couldn't see her face, we could see that, that she loved us. Yeah, that's so cool. And it was it was such a beautiful and impactful experience that I just I remember just being fixed on that I love you sign. Yeah. And um, really encountering God, the love of God, um, through her ministry mm-hmm. in that setting, in that um, dimly lit, um, <laughs> dirty camp uh, auditorium. <laughs> That's so cool. Um. (laughs) My first career, actually, we talked about this a little bit. Um, My first career was not in teaching. My first steps um, right after college were to um, apply for seminary and become a youth pastor. And Mm -hmm. I had a tragic career as a youth pastor. (laughs) I was a train wreck. I was... (laughs) As I, I describe myself in college as, you know, wanting to be an artist and not wanting to sell out, and I was all about my own creativity. And even though I'd had this uh, profound experience with the Holy Spirit, I still struggled with with relating to other people. And I think I was puzzled when I went into ministry at the beginning as, as a youth minister. I was puzzled that not everybody in the church was excited about the work of the Holy Spirit and the work that God wanted us to do together in community. There was a lot of expectation on me to entertain the kids or Mm -hmm. uh, I felt like I was kind of owned by the church and didn't have a life of my own. And I was really running into a lot of tension as a young adult in seeking to serve faithfully, but not feeling uh, fulfilled in the way I thought I would feel fulfilled. Yeah. Um, I think I had um, romanticized what ministry was going to be like. Ah. I think it was the first realization that um, that things for me weren't going to work out the way that I had dreamed that they would. Yeah. And it really angered me. I was in a time of depression and anger, and all of that just led to me uh, really kind of entering into my first deep season of rebellion hmm. against God. I was mad because I thought if I was God's good little girl, then God would give me all the promises, you know, yeah. all the good things that I'm supposed to name and claim. Sure. Uh, <laughs> That's right. Light yourself in the Lord. He'll give you the desires <laughs> of your heart, right? That's right. Yeah. So I had my list of what I thought God should give me. God wasn't giving me my demands. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I entered into a season of of kind of a crisis of faith and a decision to try some new things and to do things my way and to explore avenues of life that um, that I'd never really allowed myself uh, to explore because my faith was such a dominant and predominant part of my life early on. <sighs> In the midst of that, I mean, you know, was God distance? Was God silence? Uh, was the predominant attitude you had was an anger toward God that kind of like isolated yourself intentionally in that or, or not? And where were you in that? I would say that my concept of of myself, my, my understanding of myself 
Um, and I, I wasn't really grounded in my identity in Christ. Yeah. Even though I had experienced salvation, I experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I experienced calling, uh, even Emmaus. I had gone my Emmaus walk, but still, <laughs> I wasn't rooted and grounded in the knowledge of God's deep love for me, just as I am. Mm -hmm. uh, and so really, for the next dozen or so years, I, I waffled and struggled um, but there came a time when there was uh, a, just an inbreaking of, of, of the sense of God's presence and the sense of God's calling me back into uh, a healthy relationship with God. Yeah. Um, and that happened uh, really close to my, around my 40th birthday. Yeah, so what happened is I remember being 39 and, you know, I thought this, my thoughts about it were this is not the life that I thought I would have. This is not the life I dreamed of for myself. Yeah. And it went on to this is not the life I believe God has for me. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and having that realization that I was living some life other than the one that I deeply desired to live um, really caused me to open up um, to God's possibilities again. And um, one of the things I did in, in response to my feeling like this is not my life I'm living, I got braces. I, I got braces <laughs> to straighten up my teeth um, at 39. Um, and it, it's funny, but now I see like, even that is kind of prophetic to me. Like the braces were aligning my teeth and straightening out my teeth and bringing order to my mouth. Yeah. All while the Holy Spirit began like uh, embracing me and bringing uh, order and um, alignment in in my <laughs> life as a whole. Uh, yeah. That's kind of corny, but that's a uh, uh, that's kind of when I look back at those pictures with braces on my teeth. Uh, <laughs> I remember my, my really deep desire to want to be aligned with God now. Um, oh, that's so, so cool. That's so cool. I ended, I ended a relationship that I had been in for a long time that I had felt like I was stuck in. Yeah. Um, I just felt the freedom to say, this is the end of this and it's time for me to move on. Mm -hmm. And when that ended then i found like things rising to the surface a lot of resentment and regret and woundedness uh, really came up and in the uh, in the couple of years following that breakup um I, I was participating in the storehouse house of prayer mm -hmm. which is modeled after ihop international house of prayer in right. kansas city mm -hmm. Yep. And so I would go into the storehouse with my broken heart, <laughs> and I would step into this environment where um, there was constant prayer and worship and constant reading of the scripture and, and singing of, uh, of the scripture. Um, and I would go into this saturated environment and encounter the presence of God in a powerful, powerful way. <laughs> That's very cool. That's all very good. All right, um, very good. We're gonna we're gonna wind down. Um, any anything, Carol? Anything you want to? Uh, you know, I was gonna. The question is, you know, are your heart is your heart free? Anything particular you want to touch base on before I lighten it up a little bit? Anything you might you 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 feel you haven't shared or you want to bring clarity to or anything like that? The thing that I wanted to um, share with you about a significant turning point that I felt um, is a place I go back to in my memory, uh, remembering what God did. One, one in particular happened um, in worship at a conference 10 years ago, and that was the conference that I rode in the church van with you and your, your church members. Too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's in 2010. Mm -hmm. Um. The, the time that I described at the House of Prayer um, was about a two-year period of, of 
growing and healing. And it took me to the place where I was really hungering to be um, spiritually fed and be in the company of other people who were worshiping um, in spirit-filled worship and where I knew that ministry, personal ministry and healing ministry would be happening. Yeah. And so I reached out on Facebook and I put a random post out there. Uh, hey, anybody go into the Aldersgate Conference? <laughs> <laughs> and I think at that time I had about 1,500 Facebook friends. And I thought, this is a shot in the dark. Now, you know that's just absurd. You know that's way too many. You do realize that. You need to purge your roles, Carol. That's all there is to it. I <laughs> purge the roles, right. If I had to pay taxes on those people, I'd be um, apportionment. Sorry. That's right. That's right. Um, yeah, so it was kind of a kind of a like laying out a fleece, you know, like yeah. in the old testament story. Um, it was like if somebody responds to this, then I'm supposed to go. So is anybody out there going to the Alders Gate conference? Well, at the time, I was really, really struggling with depression. And honestly, I was afraid to even drive uh, because I had just flashes of thoughts. I uh, was real insecure about what, what I might do uh, while driving, um, that I might make a, a bad choice that could end my life or hurt somebody else. I was just really in a bad place. Mm -hmm. um, but all of this was in this time where I was experiencing just this uncovering of things that needed healing in my life. So when you responded to my Facebook post saying that you and your church were going to the conference and I could ride with you, uh, that was a wide open door from God and I knew it. <laughs> but, um, but what happened is I had to take uh, I had to be courageous and get in my car and drive 45 minutes to come to your church. <laughs> That's right. Um, and over a big bridge, which terrified me. Um, and so that uh, that morning, I just remember getting up before before daylight, driving there. So we got to the conference, and I thought, okay, so I came with these folks, but I don't need to get too familiar with them. So I'm going to, I'm just going to work the room because that's what I do. Yes. So yes. I sat with y'all once in worship, but then I went and sat the back corner. Then I moved over to the other side during another worship service, and I had moved up, you know, I was literally working the room in an attempt to stay kind of detached and not be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And... The worship team began singing Amazing Grace, and in typical Carol style, I thought, well, they've got the rhythm wrong. You know, <laughs> what What are they doing to the rhythm? Don't they know Amazing Grace? You know, so we're kind of annoyed because they had really botched the rhythm. Um, <laughs> What I didn't know is, I didn't know this Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone uh, version. Right. And as they were singing Amazing Grace, it was so, um, it was inspiring to me to watch other people worship. Yeah. And um, I just thought, oh man, that's, that's so sweet how they're experiencing the presence of God. You know, and I don't mean it in a demeaning or sarcastic way but I, I was detached emotionally from this experience that they were having but I was glad that they were having it sure and um, so I just watched other people enjoy worship um, and then the worship team got to the refrain my chains are gone I've been set free my God my Savior has rescued me um, and I was propelled out of my chair into worship in the most overwhelming way. I had an overwhelming sense of gratitude for what God has done and what God will do, what God has the capacity and heart to do in my life. It just, um, I'm a quiet worshiper. I like to be on the floor, be small, make myself small in worship, be still and know that I'm God. And this just was a real... Uh, 
like a boom lowered lowered on me and i just sure. was catapulted um <laughs> and um that moment of worship um in that time, I just began to hear the voice of God. Yeah. And what the heart of God was saying to me was that I needed to go back and be with the folks who I came with and allow myself to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And so I got up and I moved and I came over back to the front left side where y'all were sitting. Mm -hmm. Um. And there I sat when someone brought the banner that says, for those who revere my name, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. <laughs> From Micah, I believe. Yeah. Is that Micah? Um, and that banner was just like uh, flowing in, in the air right by us. And I remember yeah. that. Everything was just so vivid right then. And I, I thought, wow. God's going to heal somebody. God's going to heal somebody. And that's why he wanted me over here so I could see God healing somebody and I could enjoy that too. Um, what I didn't know is that the person who would be healed that night was me. Yeah. And um, because of the healing I experienced, mind, body, and spirit, I was able to, over the the next couple of years to say yes to the call to ministry mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah so that it, yeah that moment of worship was so significant right right we are winding down winding down winding down all right um so okay any, any anything else you want to no um, that's that's good i'm ready for your three you're cool I'm ready for three other questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the three questions, ladies and gentlemen. Um, okay. Your favorite meal. What's your favorite meal right now? My favorite meal of all time. All time. Is a buttery grilled cheese sandwich made in an iron skillet. <laughs> made by my mama in her kitchen about midnight. <laughs> that's excellent you put a setting to it you just you're just and i need a cold bottle of ketchup because i will probably have about four ounces of ketchup uh with that grilled cheese sandwich <laughs> a little grilled cheese with my ketchup that to me that well that's that's the that's the that's the that's the, that's the campbell's uh tomato soup angle right. to it that's too, but ketchup, cold ketchup with a warm sandwich is really good. <laughs> That's my comfort food, and and with my mama right there. Yeah. So. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. So you so then you're um, because my meals might change and my artists might change, my movies might change, but right now they're they're the same that they were. I mean, I yeah, um, yeah. Uh, steam shrimp, you know, done well. Uh, um, it's just I just eat, I eat my weight in it. That's just great. Um, well, we need to have a um, low country bowl is what we need to have. That that might be my favorite food next. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh my. When you when you when anybody com combines you know uh, good crustaceans with um, sausage, you know yeah. you just kind of yeah, it's like the best of both worlds. And then you put in that you know you put in that uh, corn on the cob. It's just like and you know and red potatoes. It's like oh my goodness, God made yeah. this. That is like, I think that might be the great banquet one day. Absolutely. Why wouldn't it be? For crying out loud. Um, absolutely. Cheese and crack. That's just wonderful. Okay. Um, <laughs> where were we? Oh, oh. Uh, uh, favorite artist. What's your favorite artist? Well, um, I'm going to go the visual arts route in my answer. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I am a visual artist. Yes. Um, my favorite artist is Georgia O'Keeffe. Okay. Excellent. And I, as a young person, I thought Georgia O'Keeffe must have like um, made her paintings like more abstract, uh, like stylized, like she must have looked at the mountains and just generalized yeah. of how they looked. Um, but when I went out, I got the opportunity to go camping in the desert in Juarez, Mexico <laughs> uh, as, as a young adult yeah. uh, on a kitchen trip. 
and I stood out in the desert looking at the mountains, looking at the hills as the sun reflected on them, and I saw that beauty that Georgia O'Keeffe captured in, in many of her paintings, and I realized she was painting realistically. It wasn't stylized. It wasn't abstracted. Um, and just the beauty of, of that mm -hmm. uh, really grabbed my heart, and it really uh, strengthened my love of her art. That's very cool. That's... She's my favorite artist. That's I like really to neat. Try to paint like her. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very cool. I know you've probably have said before, and I can't remember. What is your favorite movie? Well, I um, I I joined Amazon Prime a while back, and now Amazon Prime thinks that my favorite movies are about old English spinsters who run dusty. <laughs> Old Spencer who run dusty bookshops, okay? <laughs> um, so basically, anything in that genre appeals to me. Yeah. Uh, and I think I think this is maybe because I went on a Meryl Streep binge. Ah. So uh, my Meryl Streep binge started with the movie Julie and Julia. So if I need to put my finger on <laughs> one movie, that's the gateway movie for me that led to this uh, old English spinsters running <laughs> bookshops. This is really weird. Um, <laughs> uh, Go in that direction. The movie Julie and Julia. Yeah, yeah. With Amy Adams, where Meryl Streep plays Julia Child. Yes. And um, Amy Adams, Julie, is yes. a struggling new blogger. Right. Um, so that I just think that was a really cute movie, and it had a lot of. Uh, emotion and frustration and a longing to have a purpose and to be disciplined and um, I just really could identify with the Amy Adams character in that and so that's cool but but now I am on this search for movies about old English spinsters <laughs> running dusty bookshops <laughs> Maybe that's my destiny or something. Maybe I, I I'll don't end up know. I don't think I don't think that's I don't think that's true. Even though they're probably you know they're probably feral cats that probably walk in and out of them. In and out. Yeah, in and out of the bookstore. Grilled cheese and ketchup. Uh, warm sandwich and cold ketchup. Okay, still wrapping my head around that. Grilled cheese, yeah. And keep the ketchup. But that's okay. That's okay. That's that's why I'm asking what your favorite meal is. Anyway, um, Carol, we're, we're glad that uh, you shared your story and that really, honest to goodness, that we've been a part of your story. You certainly are a part of ours. So God bless you and God bless what God is doing in and through you in these days. I'm glad you are listening out there. Uh, however you're listening to us, be sure to, uh, if you can leave a comment, do so on whatever platform it is. If you want to subscribe on that platform, I encourage you to do that. And uh, if you're hearing us, you know, indirectly through Facebook, if you found us on Facebook, be sure to give us a thumbs up or give us a comment there just so we all know that you are listening. That would be great. All right. Y'all take care. We'll see you along the journey. Bye-bye.